And I want to welcome you to TechSoup Global Network, especially for those of you who are who are new here. At TechSoup, we believe technology like smartphones, internet connectivity, training, and more uh, have the power to serve our communities better. And today's speakers with their Tech for Good app demos will give you a good taste of what this looks like in action. Here today we have Carlos Serra. He's a corporate uh, development director at Audience. Edward James Bass, digital and social media insight strategist for More Light Limited. And Emily McCoy, the digital specialist at WWF International. Let's thank them for being here with us. Uh, so first up, let's welcome Carlos Serra, the corporate development director at Audience. Uh, and Audience, Car Carlos is responsible for managing partners and integration channels and ensuring seamless commercial uh, expansion. Prior to Audience, he was a director of finance and corporate development at Fits.me, a virtual fitting room. He was also an investment banker at Strata Partners and co-founder of iPlane, Inc. In 2022, Carlos was named a pioneer in the Social Intelligence Insider 50. And so let's uh, welcome Carlos. Thanks, Felipe. Thanks for the, for the introduction. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm not going to do a pitch of audience, so no worries. But just so you know, audience is an audience intelligence platform powered by social data and when we say powered by social data, rather than just looking at listening and analytics, what we are trying to do is trying to help brands and agencies connect with audiences by having better segmentation and trying to put cultural insights at the center of the strategy, which means what we are going to see. One thing that typically happens is when we talk about audience, they say, this is just for big brands. However, just so you know, we work with a lot of the small NGOs. A lot of small brands and agencies and as well, some bigger brands. So don't be afraid sometimes when you look at some of these platforms or we talk about social data that feels a bit, it's difficult. What we are going to see later with Edward and Emily is how brands can use social data. And now what we are, what I'm going to do is I wanted to leave you with one thought is the power of Twitter. Some of you might have, or might not have already a good Twitter community and a good Twitter engagement. And that means that typically you are going to think about Twitter as a channel. And that channel means, do I spend more time in Instagram? Is my community on Instagram? Is my community on LinkedIn? And that's going to be how you are going to think about Twitter typically. And also because we don't have all the time in the world. We are NGOs, whether we are small or big, we don't have all the resources. Like I like to say, we are not Coca-Cola and we don't have the budget of Coca-Cola to play around in marketing. However, Twitter is not just a channel. This is the most important lesson. Twitter's data is a compliant way for you to be able to research audiences, to understand how to connect with those audiences, no matter what channel it is, even to optimize how you plan your targeting in different networks, in your paid media. But if you chose, because you already have Twitter as a channel, because you know that the influential people are on Twitter, it's like LinkedIn. You might not spend all day in LinkedIn, but you still have a LinkedIn profile, don't you? This is the same with Twitter. You're an influential person. Even if you don't have your community on Twitter, maybe I have a 400,000 people strong army on Instagram, still I have a Twitter profile. And that means that I still get to play as an NGO. How to identify those people, how to go and acquire them and think about it. When we finish the next two slides, we'll think Twitter is the most powerful influencer marketing platform in the world. Big statement. Let's see if that's true. So if we want to be efficient because we don't have time and we want to be efficient because we don't have the budget, then we should look at the world the following way. There are three types of communities. There are the creators that are creating the original content. So let's say the Justin Beavers of the world, the j Lobes in, in the B2C world. Then there are the people amplifying that content. These are still influential. They are ampli amplifiers. They are people that actually also create their own content. At the end of the day, more importantly, here it looks like they are the same size. However, 90% of the people in the world, they are just a spectator. They are the mass. However, those are the people typically we want to reach out to, right? 
So we are going to talk to everyone. And as a brand or as an NGO, we are going to talk to everyone and we care about everyone. Actually, the people we care about are the masses. However, the most efficient way for us to get to them is to do influence marketing. I'm not saying influencer marketing. I'm saying influence marketing. How do I actually identify and how do I actually go in an efficient way quickly to all of these people to amplify my message to the masses? So that's why, particularly with Twitter, there is a very interesting way to be able to target them, which is creating lists, custom audiences or tailor audiences, they used to be called, of these influencers and targeting them. So here at Audience, Part of what we do, we use, we actually used our own tool to create lists of influential people that we outreach directly. This will be how it would look like a campaign plan for us. And in this case, I tried to cater it more to the NGO world. So I took the Olympics, the IOC. So if you thought about the IOC, trying to jump on the hashtag, choose to challenge, they had a massive there were, what, 320,000 people participating in that hashtag. And they have their followers that are good for them. They have millions of them. So there is an overlap there. That overlap will mean that I will to acquire the rest of the people, which is 336,000 individuals, users. So think about how do I go about that with paid media, for example. Am I going to pay, let's say, $1? 336,000 in trying to get all of those. There is a more clever way, right? So I actually go, I use Twitter's data through audience. You can segment the communities, who knows who, then you actually see who influences them. And that way you end up with curated lists of creators and amplifiers. So now we are down to 25,000, 25,000 people. <laughs> Don't be discouraged. Actually, some of them, they are already following you. They're already part of your community. So you can do a one-to-one -one engagement with them. You can DM them. Maybe you even know their email address. You can actually email them. So to those people, you might do a one-to-one -one interaction. And then for the rest of the people, you use the superpower of Twitter. You create a custom audience, a tailor audience of the other 25,000, and you just run one campaign. And with that, you are able to jump on the hashtag, how? Some of these people, they are not even in topic. However, they are influencers, they're influential to the overall audience. Great. So now a <laughs> couple of clicks allows me to create a curated list and target it in tweet with Twitter ads, asking them, please, we know that you are influential, please expand, retweet this, we need your help. So you see how I'm only already changing the creative for them to be more reactive. That way, I'm efficient. I'm using Twitter for what it is and what's actually powerful. It's already telling me as well the biggest journalists to go at, the biggest influencers. And I have two case studies for you. One in England, thinking of Oscar, he's a small NGO, actually someone from IBM, he created it for his son, and he was creating a cycling competition in the north of England. He created one of these campaigns. He invested something like 200 pounds. He even got some of the Olympian cyclists to retweet the message and get more fans over to the north of England in York, 200 pounds. And he had what? Olympians to retweet that without paying them money for that. That's what I call influence marketing. Without the R, it's cheaper. And the second case study is a smash in California that they used it for a one-to-one -one engagement in this case to ask people, now that they knew who resonated with them in different segments, they went one-to-one -to, -one to ask, please retweet this message. We need your help for this fundraising. And they ended up getting over the target they had. So I know sometimes we don't think about Twitter as data. The one that allows me to identify those curated lists of influencers, or it's gonna help me to optimize the paid media in other channels, or it's going to help me to identify the biggest journalist, but that's what Twitter is for. And then it's a channel where it has the best capabilities for influencer marketing and paid campaigns to those people. So that's it. That's for me. Hopefully that was useful. And, and now I'm going to take it to Emily and Edward, who, by the way, they will give you even 
more practical examples on some of these methodologies. I just gave you a little frame. All right, great. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, very interesting stuff. A lot of uh, uh, information here that uh, seems very useful for folks. So up next is Edward James Bass. Let's welcome him. Edward is highly experienced digital and social media insight strategist with expertise in audience intelligence, social listening, and digital content and media strategy. Having worked with the world's leading brands over the past decade, these, day, these days his main focus is projects relating to sustainability, environment, electric mobility, social good, and diversity. Using audience and Pulsar to understand the sustainability language of B corporations. His presentation will demonstrate how Edward used audience and Pulsar to identify the B Corps who are most active on social media and understand which environmental and sustainability related topics they talk about the most in their corporate communications. So welcome. Thank you very much. Before I start, if any of this is of interest to you, there's an article which is of the same topic as this talk, which I'll share in the chat now. But if you've got any questions about anything that I have to say, I'm more than um, happy to answer those in the Q&A afterwards. Yes, as, as just mentioned, I, uh, the founder of Insight Consultancy, and I focused about 50% of my time at the moment with NGOs, sustainability focused brands. I've been using audience for about, I think five or six years now. More recently, I've been starting to use Pulsar, which is the kind of a social listening platform it's partnered with. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit here as well. So some pretty good recent experience of, of using this kind of audience insight and social listening technology to help NGOs and, uh, sustainability focused brands really develop their strategies for communications, for media targeting, marketing. As mentioned, uh, I'll be looking at B Corps today. Now B Corps, as some of you may be aware, are they're effectively businesses which have been accredited by the B Corporation as being focused or starting or already prioritizing their activity to, to focus on sustain, sustainability and so environmental projects and social good as well. Ultimately, these are companies who have been accredited for acting and focusing on those areas. What I'm going to be doing here just briefly is showing how audience can be used to understand how this audience breaks down into individual segments, the media that influences them, which is obviously very important if you're, you're looking to develop a, a PR strategy and also the public figures, which influence them as well. And that's really focusing uh, as audiences very well on their aspect, which you'd say is finding out about who they are. If you want to learn more about who these organizations are, how they behave, then audience especially is fantastic for that. I'm then going to be moving over to Pulsar, which integrates incredibly well, really a, a, a touch of a button with audience. And using that, I'm going to demonstrate how you can take that same B Corp audience and actually understand what it is they're talking about. So specifically, what climate issues are they, are they talking about and how the conversation around these has changed over time. Okay. So first up, if you look in the top left-hand corner, this is how I, this is actually, a, these are all screenshots from the platform. Top left-hand corner is how I've used audience to identify the, uh, the B Corps that I want to analyze. So B corporations having that accreditation, it's something that they do tend to speak about very openly. And so the likelihood is, in fact, I'd say almost completely B corporations are going to have B Corp hashtag or mention they're a B Corp in their Twitter profile. An audience is fantastic at being able to search Twitter profiles and build audience groups from those. This is a relatively easy one in my line of work, to be honest. You've got a audience that's self-identifying around the, the, the topic or category that you want to understand. Fantastic. So the, to lower down on the screen, you'll see that there's a segmentation cluster. There's these kind of colored clusters of different named groups. This is part of a process that audience actually does automatically, which is to be able to look at the segmented audience, the B Corp audience in this uh, particular incident and break these down into kind of naturally segmented audiences. That is so useful in terms of actually understanding who these organizations or who these kind of broader groups are, it's really useful. 
I then used audience to give them a little bit of labeling as well. So we can understand exactly what makes them unique. With some organizations there that they're identifying themselves as being transformation focused. You have others that folks, you know, describing themselves as being purpose driven. You've got ones which are identifying as being award winners. So that's really useful. And actually what's also fantastic with audience is that each of these segments can be analyzed individually and also compared to each other and also other audiences on audience, the global audience, a national audience, a gender audience. That's really, that kind of be, ability to be able to index against other audience groups is incredibly useful. Probably my favorite feature. Carlos was talking earlier about being able to generate lists from audience. That's lists of kind of influential accounts or just general accounts who are, who are following a particular topic. What it's also fantastic at a bit is being able to identify lists of the media that the audience has an affinity with is influenced by. So unsurprisingly, really the B Corp audience that we're looking at here, the Guardian, which if you're not aware of it is a kind of a center left leaning, very kind of pro sustainability and environmental action broadsheet newspaper here in the U that's top of the list or their environmental section is and their actual main is third on the list Huffington Post which I'm sure you'll be more familiar with their green section is also very high National Geographic Fast Company as well and their in impact channel so media that's very much reflective of kind of environmental action and sustainability is popping up there this is really useful if you need to develop a PR and comm strategy, if you need to think about the publications that you want to be reaching out to or partnering with. If you want to identify potential influencers to work with, we're looking at a very top level here with Barack and Michelle Obama, Mike Bloomberg, the Dalai Lama. Obviously, that might be out of some people's reach, but you can filter down to much, much more kind of smaller impact and smaller reach influences as well. So it's not just focused on the kind of big players. You can get the very particular by nation, by audience size, by category as well. Okay. So here I've actually taken the audience from audience. So the B Corp companies that we've been analyzing. Now we've learned about who they are and the different segmentations they have. We can also learn about demographics and interests as well. I've moved those onto Pulsar, which is a, a social listening platform, which integrates incredibly well, um, with audience. And what we've done here is looking, is starting to look at how these B corporations talk about sustainability and environments, climate change over time. We can see, for instance, that during earth week of last year, sustainability saw a huge amount of resonance. Conversely, business saw a larger share of, res of resonance during COP26. This kind of insight is really useful for organizations that want to anticipate trends and respond to them. So if you're looking to develop a strategy that's based around particular events in the, the yearly calendar, this kind of social listening is a really powerful means of, of doing that. This is just some examples showing the kind of granularity that you can get down to. Obviously it's great to be able to see the sort of shape of the conversation and graph that, but social media data is made up of posts on social media. So what we're able to do here is drill down into the actual conversation. In this case, I'm actually looking at the, the earth day conversation and understand what it is these B Corps are actually saying specifically. What's really clear is that during Earth Day, the B Corps are using this particular event and successfully, I might say, in some cases, to kind of amplify messaging about the activity that they're doing. So what they're actually focusing on in terms of sustainability. Yeah, useful to understand that's something that NGOs can actually, sorry, NGOs and, and sustainability focused organizations actually can do. It's a useful insight to understand what resonates. We can also look at the hashtags that are seeing most prevalence and, and that kind of thing as well. This kind of thing can be done in real time. It can also be done with historical data as well. If you want to look backwards. Okay. So this is just a, a final slide. Really. One of the things that's really useful is being able to break down the conversation and understand the sentiment that's coming out of it. So 
what we're looking at here is how positive or negative the sentiment is that's coming from these B Corps when they're talking about sustainability uh, and social good. So one thing that's quite interesting, I find quite interesting, is the majority of conversation that you're seeing here is actually very positive. This kind of green that you're seeing some kind of peaks around particular events such as COP and Earth Day here as well. Much of the conversation is actually very positive, despite the fact that obviously a lot of the, the natural sentiment that you might see on social media around climate change and sustainability is often quite negative given the, the risks of climate crisis. So what this is tells us, and this is reflected a little bit on the last slide as well, is, you know, a lot of the communications that come out from B Corps, they are look, they're positively focusing on the steps that they're taking around sustainability and climate and less directly engage about the risks, et cetera, which quite frankly is understandable because they are, it's a company account and they're going to be wanting to be posting more positive rather than negative messages. And that is really everything I have to share with you today. As I mentioned, the blog post, um, which I've shared in the chat, I can share again now. That goes into a little bit more detail as well, if you're interested. But if you've got any questions, just feel free to fire them at me at the end of the call. Great. Thank you, Edward. Great stuff. Very, uh, very insightful and, and strategic, to say the least. So. Thank you for that, that presentation. Next is uh, Emily uh, McCoy, uh, the digital specialist at WWF International. At WWF, Emily works to advocate nature positive world through specifically tailored communications online. Passionate supporter of sustainable development and the environment. She previously worked for the Fair Trade Foundation and the Soil Association, communicating to wide ranging audiences from farmers to consumers to governments across a range of platforms and media. And in her presentation, but using the lists of, of targeted advocacy, building audiences based on niche interests to advocate for a nature positive future. Welcome. Thanks Felipe for that great introduction. I don't need to introduce myself at all now. So I'll just dive straight into the presentation. So I'm going to talk to you as you can see about how we tailor our, or our targeting on social media and how we build a really niche audience. So everyone's heard of WWF. We're probably one of the most recognized NGOs in the world, if not the most recognized or one of the ones with the most social media followers. I have looked that up and we have amazing brand recognition. I'm sure you recognize. Slides. And this is built through a network of, if you go back, sorry, <laughs> this is built through a network of supporters, which is 5 million at the latest count. And with this branding, so we've, re we've worked hard to build the brand, uh, but it's coupled with campaigns to build supporter numbers. Um, and in the past, this has been traditionally focused around protecting endangered species. You should see the circle on the right with the dolphin. As one of the campaigns run by WWF around the world. But of course we do a lot more. So I'll go on to the next, please. Next slide. Please. So my area of work is operating against this background of really strong brand recognition. And because we've built up such a big public awareness, we've got the space to operate in more niche areas and it allows us to influence policy and decision-making at global and national. And so many charities, as I'm sure many on this call will know, have this kind of dual approach to campaigning on one hand, raising public awareness and on the other advocating, advocating for change at political level. Although I do need to note that we are a non-partisan organization, of course. So I'm going to talk a bit more about how we target these people because my area of work, as I've said, is specifically in the policy and advocacy side. So I'm going to talk about how we target these people via the traditional comms channels that everyone uh, will be aware of. As Felipe mentioned in my introduction. Our big focus this year is Nature Positive by 2030. You can see my logo in my picture somewhere in my background. And the focus for this is on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And this is a plan for nature that will lay the foundations for the next 10 years or next eight years now. We've, we've missed a couple of years with COVID. And we hope this plan is going to reverse biodiversity loss for a future that is nature positive. So this nature positive mission, or WWF believes that a nature positive mission is essential to achieving this. I would encourage everyone to look this up because this is uh, the, yeah, as I said, the main area of my work and I'm very passionate about it if you're interested. But now we're talking about audiences. Again, this is the mission statement that we're pushing. Uh, so just for a bit more info for wherever you want. And the meetings are actually taking place now in Geneva. So last week, this week, and next week, 
and the final global biodiversity framework will be agreed later this year. So who exactly are these people? What and how are we going to target them? I would really like to know if anyone here recognizes these people. I haven't put their names on the slide. Please drop in the chat if you do, but I'm presuming people won't recognize these people. So we have from left to right, Elizabeth Marema, and she is the executive secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And he is the co-chair for the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity's open-ended working group. And Inga Anderson, who is the executive director of the United Nations Environment. And as you might tell from their titles, they are key players in instigating this global plan for nature that we're focusing on. So in a way, these are our, these are our influences. These are our celebs of the, the policy nature world. So these are the people that we want to influence. So you're probably asking at this point, how does digital media fit in? So my area of work is again, I'm focusing on the digital side, like many organizations and like pretty much everyone in the world. We use the same platforms um, that everyone will use to contact the people who we want to contact. But for this specific kind of targeting, looking at the people from the previous slide and the rest of sort of similar audiences that they would be include, we pretty much use just Twitter. Obviously, WWF operates on across all channels, but for this, the messages we want to get across, these are the channels that we're focusing on, that we're focusing on. And that's because the people we want to target are on those channels. And just to add, we do have our own specific advocacy channel, which is at Nature Deal on Twitter. So please feel free to have a look at that if you want some more info. I'm going to drill down into our strategy a little bit. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, into this quite complicated infographic, but just point out that our influencers sit somewhere in the middle of the triangle. So that's the influencers that, that are relevant to our, our, and usually you'll find most accounts that have a lot of people. Most, most accounts have a lot of people with few followers. So if we look at a Twitter account, for example, or a social media account, you'll find a lot of them will be in the, a lot of their followers are in the bottom. Well, I've actually turned the triangle upside down, which just doesn't make it very easy for me to explain this infographic. You'll find that most of their followers are in the bottom, which means they have few followers uh, and not so many of the high reaching influencers, which are those with a lot of followers. And one way to get more of the higher reaching influencers is to target those with fewer followers. So eventually you build up your follower numbers and then the higher reaches, the you know, celebs will follow you then. However, this is, we have quite a different audience. We're after quite a niche audience. And this is potentially quite a little bit more tricky, although in principle, a lot of them are the same. And another disclaimer, I will be talking about audience, although we have got Carlos and Edward on the line. So apologies if I repeat anything, but I think it's a slightly different angle. So hopefully it will be of use to you all. We use audience to work out what our target audience is interested in. Edward did a really good summary of how we can do that. And we look at who they're following and how we can engage with them, how we can get them to follow us and how sort of subsequently, how we can get them to engage with our key messages, for example, nature positive. So in summary, it's a focus on content and engagement that there's lots of tools we use to back up this overall strategy. And if we look a bit more, a, li a little bit more into the, our audience, so you might, 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 excuse me, you might recognize the style here. This is directly from our audience platform, our platform audience with an S. It's quite tricky talking about our audience versus audience. So I'm going to try and balance that out. And we can, we're pretty happy with our profile of our, our Twitter followers. As you can see on the, the, the word found on the right hand side, nature and climate stand out as key topics. So this is a good sign that is, this, our strategy is working and the quality of our followers uh, matches up with what we're talking about. Again, so content is king. Yes, I'm sure you've heard that before, but what we, we use audience, but we use the audience connect feature and work out what kind of content people will engage in. And this is us looking at other types of things our audience is engaging in, working out, matching it with the stuff we're putting out to our followers. And the other big benefit of audience is that we use it for building lists and similar audiences. I know Carlos mentioned this in his previous talk. So we we've spent a lot of time curating lists of the specific negotiators and the specific political figures we want to influence. And then we use this and we link this with our Twitter ads platform and it 
you can do something similar with Twitter ads, but it makes it a bit more streamlined, a bit easier just to make sure we're targeting the very specific people that we're after. So in summary, our strategy is to one, work out who we have following us. And when I started this role, we did a full social media audit of the followers we already had. And that's where that snazzy upside down triangle I showed you came from. Second, we, we want to increase the content that works. And so this is possible through looking at things like the word cloud that I showed previously. So we can see what kind of topics our audience is interested in. We want to maximize partnerships. So we actually work in partnership with a lot of other NGOs. And this incre helps increase the airtime for the projects and the advocacy work. So basically if what we're advocating for is backed by other NGOs as well, we can promote it across many channels and many accounts, not just WWF. So for these kind of global policy change campaigns, that's really important. And I'll talk about that in the next slide a little bit more. And finally, number four, more on content really. And this is the area we are pushing for continually. This is the area we're always stumped with providing enough content in and more content is always good in my opinion so we would like to do more commenting on current affairs quick responses get folks people to share their opinions and we find all of this sort of stuff uh, our audience responds very well to so to bring it back to the example i used nature positive hashtag nature positive uh, this graph shows how much this hashtag has grown in the last two years and this is from the strategy that we Put in place again we've worked with partners as i mentioned uh, but it's also shows that we've done really niche targeting of the people we want to reach and honing in on these individuals and we also use things like follower lookalike hashtag engagement and all of the tools and the tricks of the trade really but um this is a nice positive story and for us to finish with or for me to finish with and it's not through just advertising and this is obviously integrated across all media I work closely with colleagues on press and PR and events uh, like the United Nations General Assembly, which takes place in September. So if you look really closely, you can see a big peak around these events and also the launch of the Leaders Pledge for Nature, which coordinated lots of different countries around the world to endorse a pledge for nature. Again, this is all backing up the same kind of ideas and the same campaign. So it has a, a cumulative effect as well as this very targeted digital approach. And I've been banging on about it enough, but here is some of the content that we've been creating and putting out over the last years. And thank you very much. That's all from me. I'm looking forward to hearing any questions. Pretty. Thank you, Emily. Uh, great presentation. Uh, so let's thank all of our presenters before we jump into our Q and A. So thank you, Emily. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Carlos. A reminder that we'll be sharing the replay from today's event, the slides, any links shared, and, and an email within a couple of days. And now it's time to jump over to the Q and A. So let me stop sharing my screen here. And let's see here. Let's see. We have a question here, and we wish some that were answered. But let's go to the open one first. Okay, let's see. Actually, I'm, I'm from Washington, had a, a question that I thought was interesting. I answered that, right. but I was saying, I found that these influenced groups are very volatile. One step outside their group think or any, every other topic that may come with, within their ongoing purview and they're all jump ship. In terms of unfollowing, isn't that a very unstable base? And that could be either for Edward or Emily. I'm happy to answer on this first. And if you want to add afterwards, Edward, mainly because I have some experience of working with different types of influencers and one type is quite volatile. Yes. So it depends who you're targeting and why you're targeting them. I think in general, if you want, and I know it was an example raised earlier in, in the webinar, which was the example Carlos used about the cyclist and all of the Olympians retweeting his, his comments on his challenge. And I think the key is to get something that they actually genuinely care in, care about. And then they will, of course, be happy to share your, your campaigns because it's close to their heart. So that requires research and understanding of who they are as a person, as well as what their motives are. So it, that's where you get the kind of the non paid for promotion through influencers. But yeah, it is, it's very challenging and lots of organizations have a specific person who will work with influencers. I hope that's helped a little bit. Yeah. Just to add to that, that's a, that's a 
great answer. Is also, I think it probably is worth beyond just generating a list. Any time that you can spend exploring what that audience is also talking about as well is really helpful. So that you're getting integrating social listening a little bit sometimes can help you just get a bit more of a steer in terms of what their kind of passions are and where the sort of red lines might be as well. So yeah, it's worth kind of digging into to the audience groups and then online conversations just to, you know, make sure that you've got not just the right audience, but you're responding to them in a way which kind of reflects the way that they already behave. Yeah, that's a very interesting one, Edward, because what you're incorporating there is if you have a hundred people, you want them to retweet you in the future. It's not whether you outreach when you need them or you try to send them some emails from time to time. Social data is the only place where you can listen to every conversation those hundred people are posting and you can analyze it, the hashtags that they are using. You can analyze what topics they are using, but as well, if you are just on your community management tool, like a hood suite and you're monitoring their conversations, it helps you as well to jump on the conversations anytime that it's relevant. So something I do is I have 50 people I really want to interact with and I have all their tweets jumping on my screen as they happen. And it's a lot of noise, but the reality is that stream provides me two or three opportunities to engage every day and to understand what they are actually talking about, what's the sense, what's trending. So when you were, when, when I was thinking about the masses, think, forget about the mass. Think about this audience of influencers as the audience. And I always say it's like gold. You focus on the small ball, despite of being 500 yards in front of you. The small ball, those influencers, understand them, nurture them, think what, and then jump on them. But it's not just, I have a list of 50 people and I shoot them to read with a particular content because that actually can be very successful if you are WF. But if you are, think of Oscar, they don't care sometimes, right? It's more difficult. And that, that's also part of the problem with NGOs. Sometimes it's not an NGO that anyone knows, or it's not as well known. And they, they feel that they are fighting there for attention. It's difficult without the budget. You've mentioned something else there, actually, that springs to mind is that you, what you're talking about there, when you, you're following them in real time, a little bit, like if you're analyzing their social conversations historically, I find that really humanizes the audience. So. I think digital marketing people especially fall into the trap of starting to treat lists and statistics. Like we get that it's actually human beings. It's not robots or computers. It's genuine human beings. And that it's amazing how much from my experience of working in marketing agencies back in the day, it's amazing how much that gets forgotten about. And I really, I think getting into the conversation, learning as much about those human beings as possible and as human beings and not a set of statistics is tantamount to effective strategies. And I, I really love how that kind of technology helps do that. Really great. Thank you for that great conversation there back and forth. Uh, I have a question here from Andrew. Do you have any criteria to suggest as a minimum for an audience for deriving insights? By, by that, should there be a minimum number of Twitter accounts being examined? Does diversity of location and or entity versus person help with insights? Yep. I'm going to take that one very quickly. So without trying to compete with market research, where you will have to actually get some of that. When we're looking at influencers as an audience and to nurture them, there is no minimum number. If you're actually looking at a particular audience profile to try to derive insights, that's a great question. So I'm going to give you the following. If I analyze the followers of WWF in Iceland, Okay. There might be people who are interested because of one particular subject or the other. It's just going to give you a profile, right? Let's say there is 10,000, 50,000 people following them. There might not be the diversity that you are requiring for a proper market research of Iceland as a country or the topic as it, as such. However, it is true that through the segmentation and now I segment their audience and I find there is a group of journalists, there is a group of people interested in that year, there is a group of NGOs and activists, and I look at each of those audiences. What am I looking at? 
Am I trying? Why am I doing that? That's what we need to realize. See, I'm going after the demographics to build the type of persona that we used to do for marketing organizations in the past, or I'm going to touch this, for example, for digital PR, and I want to find sources of influence. If it's the latter, then on that, now you have for NGOs and activists, what are the sources of influence? For the journalists, what are the sources of influence? And that's actually statistically significant for most of the times. In order for me to understand people working in WWF now as a whole, I don't need everyone and a representation between even genders. What I need is maybe 25, 40 people across the whole organization to understand their sources of influence. That's part of it. Sometimes also we need to work also with the data that we get, but that also gives you an idea. It, the, sometimes the smallest segments or just because you have not many people, if the purpose is something like the PR, doesn't really matter. It's actually quite more than enough. hundred is the minimum that you can create a report with others. That's a different question, Andrew. Great. Thank you for that. There's another question. Does audience only work with Twitter or with other social media platforms as well? It's a great question. Sorry, Ed and Emily on that. Great. Did I say that Twitter has two superpowers at least and one of them is data? So everyone in the world, you might think that actually all the networks, they are open and you can get it. It's not true. You would say, no, a tool that actually you can do something on TikTok. Problem here is two things. One is compliant data. Uh, that would mean that a lot of platforms that they are giving you analytics, they are scraping data. If it's not a native platform, it's fine to use it. It's just how you want to use it. We need to be careful sometimes what we use. Still, that's data. But all of that data that typically is analytics of followers of WWF, for example, sorry, I'm picking up on you and that. That would mean account intelligence. That would mean who is the average person following this account. And it doesn't give you that level of granularity. What you're trying to work is audiences, which is a bit different to just people following a particular account. I want to see potential groups of supporters. If <laughs> there is another question for a library somewhere in the US, then you are going to have to work harder than just people following a particular account. So Twitter is the only place where you can really do uh, market research for audiences. It's different, but it, there are lots of tools. Emily, I'm sure that you use some tools for Instagram and LinkedIn particularly, right? To find sources of influence and demographics. Yeah, yeah. We actually use a selection of different monitoring and sort of social listening tools. I'm not entirely sure why they don't all necessarily work together. But it, like you're saying, kind of, there's not data for each platform on one. They're not always in the same place. So it, it can be slight. Yeah. If Facebook disappears, marketers will find the next channel. If Twitter disappears, we as a community will be screwed up because there is no substitute today for Twitter data to perform marketing and market research. There is none. You, you might think that some of the tools that you use, they are more than Twitter data and maybe they are not even just Twitter data and you are confused. You don't know how deep the rabbit hole goes with Twitter data. It's crazy. It's crazy. I, I hope as a marketer and a market researcher that will never happen. Great. Thank you for that. Another question here. Can you explain what a B corporation is? Yeah. Yeah. I thought I'd covered that on the, I've been talking to you quickly. Yes. B corporations are, which, uh, I believe comes from, I think benefit corporation was the original term for it. They are organizations which have been accredited for focusing on social good and sustainability. So they have been given a specific accreditation for that work. And I think every three years have to demonstrate that they are carrying out those actions as well. It's, it's something I'd recommend any business really do, should be doing, especially given the very clear impact of climate change that we're seeing now. It's very important that, that businesses do that. And I think from sort of tapping into my experience of brand marketing, I think it helps the organize, it helps the planet. It also helps organizations, businesses give themselves an identity and give themselves a kind of a direction and a North star above and beyond just making money, which I think is probably, I'd like to think is going to be something like a, a, an organization that is purely there for shareholder value or generating profit is hopefully going to be something we see the end of, well, hopefully the end of the 21st century, who knows? I'd hope so. I'd expect. So it's a great, in, in a sense, it's great to have a, an organization that's managing that accreditation as well. 
long answer. Sorry. That's great. Thank you. Just to kind of follow up with that. So would uh, organizations that have a triple bottom line, people, planet, profits be considered, maybe not officially, but the way they be considered is uh, a B Corp. In, in yeah, I mean, they, they, they have to go through accreditation in order to, to get that kind of stamp of, of being a B. It's not something you can just play. You need to actually get it through a, a process of, of explaining and detailing the actions, which I believe is actually quite in depth as well. So it's not, it's not like any organization can just suddenly start claiming that they're a B Corp. They have to be, they have to be accredited for that. Okay. Thank you. Another question here. Uh, can you separate out hashtag mentions posted by your own accounts and others? It was asked already, but just thought I'd bring it up. Anybody want to handle that one? So yeah. So you can do both on, if you go to Hootsuite, if you're using Hootsuite on your monitoring feed, you can actually split comments that they are not being posted by a particular account. So I could do it. Serita22, it's me. So anyone who talks about Serita, mentions Serita22 in the tweet, but does not actually come from Serita22. So that will be one way. The other way for analytics will be that when Emily was showing that, the, that chart, she should have excluded any posts being posted by WWF themselves. And that way she will actually have taken her own post and just focus on her media. That is a very good point. I did not do that, but I also wanted to show that it had grown. So there was a reason. I yeah. And you can work on that slide. If you apply on top, what Edward was saying of listening to influencers, they would be interesting because you will overlay your post and their media of your post and the post of the group of influencers and their air media. And together, both those, you will actually see some sparkles potentially coming that, and it will rebase how that engagement has been working over time. I love how, Emily, you touch base on, on something because you see how that goes up and down. I'm sure there is correlation with when content is being posted. The way that you see influencer marketing being a digital function is it's actually, can I find as many partners as possible to get the biggest amplification where you work one by one? And that's a very mature way because sometimes that's the biggest organic way of distribution today is doing partnerships on newsletters and publications. It's not just posting on social media. Is that what you meant by working with them, like deeper than just a pure post? Yeah, exactly. So we touched upon, we have a, a, quite an integrated comms campaign across different, so PR, media and campaigns and advocacy. And the advocacy very much works with, and that's why I started my presentation with these three, hopefully unknown figures. So. We work with, for example, bird life or the nature conservancy, and they support this nature positive mission as well. So if, and then we have events or sort of news hooks that we would focus all of the activity around. And this way we can really, we can both get people behind the campaign and we can also drive, um, engagement on social or online. Interesting. So a tactic that even audience could apply today is that you work with bird life. So what you can do is now you can take followers of bird life that are not following WWF, create a list with that, and either you can engage with them or you can advertise to them. It's as simple as that. So if you know accounts that their followers should be following you, you can create those custom lists and you can advertise to them. That's different. I remember that you said something in your sentence. That's different to what Twitter ads does natively, which is called handle targeting. So when you input handle targeting, you put bird life, what Twitter does is it takes followers of bird life, maps their characteristics and advertises to people like bird life followers, no matter whether they follow bird life or they don't. So if I have a partnership with bird life, I could create a custom audience of those who are not already in my community to even be more efficient with my budget. And I can advertise to only those followers with content about WWF and bird life coming back to. How do I actually even give more amplification next month after I've BirdLife published it in the newsletter? Well, take that same content, redistribute it with Twitter ads to those people who did not already engage with you. And that way you are giving more bucks for the same partnership. Okay, great. Th thank you so much. So what's it, want to thank our uh, 
three presenters uh, today, Emily McCoy, Edward James Bass, and Carlos. This has been a great presentation. Hope you learned a lot.